marvelous week with your son up in Alaska. We went on his boat trip. It was a right. great adventure. 13 hours. Yeah. As I understand it, most races, you have to stand up all the time, or did you? I think he would have gone again the next day. He is the most energetic <laughs> fellow I've ever seen. He... Yes, but you haven't been you haven't been doing that regularly. No, for me it was one, a one-time trip. Once was uh, funny. I heard about it. I suggested you not ask me to go for a boat ride. <laughs> have you been on a one of the I never did ask. Him. Let's get one. Just a couple of questions. How are you today, sir? All right. Good. Great. Goodness, somehow they're quicker with yours. <laughs> somehow they're quicker getting you wired than mine. <laughs> we interviewed Mike, and uh, he uh, gave us some stories about growing up on the, on the ranch, uh, some of his early recollections and this type of thing. So yeah, I tried to start him to, out on okay. a horse. <laughs> All right, good. Everybody set? Rolling? Okay. Mr. President, some of Mike's earliest recollections were there on the ranch. He said that you genuinely did chop that wood and ride those horses. <laughs> what do you remember about him? Well, he was um, quite small for many of those years, and uh, as, no, he, he loved to help when he was very small and uh, really unable to help with some of those. I gave him some boards and nails and a hammer and told him to make a jabberwock. And he wanted to know what that was, and I said, just, you know, he put some boards together, and that's what it is, and oh, he was very happy with, <laughs> with that. Were you ever disappointed he didn't go into either the theater or into politics or didn't follow you, perhaps, in ranching? No, no, I've, uh, I've always felt about all of them that they're on their own. No one told me what to do, huh, what to do with my life, and uh, I wouldn't tell them. Um, the funny thing is, very early after he uh, got out on his own and uh, uh, he became interested in, in the boat racing. And uh, boat racing can be an expensive sport. But uh, he didn't wait until he could afford a hobby. And uh, so I did get into that with him, and I said, look, you love this so much, and you are so good at it. At one point, I guess, he was rated nationally number one. And I said, uh, why don't you go in that business? And then the hobby can... You can afford it because it'll actually be a part of what uh, you're doing for a living. And he did. He, and he was very successful in the, uh, in the speedboat business, well, the boating business generally. He had an accident uh, once, I think he was describing it in Texas, where he smashed up some ribs and hurt himself and so yeah. forth. And now he's running an enormously powerful boat through waters at uh, any time, day or night. Uh, the weather makes no difference. Yes. They go. As a father, uh, are you concerned? For his safety? Well, yes, you can't help but think about that. Uh, I know that he lost a motor on this ride mm -hmm. that you were on with him, uh, hitting a deadhead there in the water, okay. as they call those submerged logs right. and things. But I also saw some uh, TV tape of him when he set a record from uh, across the Great Lakes from Chicago to Detroit. And in that film, I saw that boat, and it's no small boat. As you know, it's a, I don't know just what the length is, but it's pretty good sized boat, but I saw somewhere it was totally airborne mm -hmm. for at least uh, two lengths of the boat when it came off a wave and was, and uh, tell me, uh, did you have to stand up? Because he told me that on that, on that one that, uh, and I just assumed that that was regular, that the crew all have to stand the entire duration of the trip. You stand up, you hold on, and you hope. <laughs> the entire trip because it's a boat that seems to almost want to fly. They're so powerful. Yeah. Tell me one thing he told about at the uh, at the ranch was, uh, you know, it's for real. This business of you're going there to to refresh your spirit. He said you go and plug into a tree to get your emotional batteries <laughs> recharged. Is that correct? Well, I don't know if that's exact, but something like that. I I it's do admit uh, that quotation uh, fits. I look to the hills from whence cometh my strength. But um, no, he's right. I remember once, uh, there's always something to do at a ranch. And I've built more miles of fence than anyone will ever believe. And more recently, on the present ranch, the, I've been building those fences. I decided some fences that had to more or less fit the scenery. So uh, they're building them out of telephone poles. And that can get to be kind of heavy work, notching the poles. You get about a 25-foot pole, cut the bottom six feet off for a post, notch it, then cut the uh, about a 14-foot length and get rid of the little stub at the top. 
and uh, notch the ends of that and fit them in. But uh, somebody asked me once when all this, when they said, well, when are you going to have the ranch finished? <laughs> and I said, well, I hope never, because uh, I don't, no, I'm not a rancher in this, uh, the kind that wants to walk around with a walking stick uh, looking at the scenery. I, I like the work. As president, uh, has it put a demand on, uh, on family uh, contact, staying in touch with Mike, uh, with uh, Colleen, with Ashley, with Cameron, the, the grandchildren? Uh, do you have as much time as you'd like to? No, no, and particularly uh, since he's not fixed in one place either. For example, uh, I know a number of times that we've gone to California with the anticipation we would and then found he was off on one of these boating ventures and as you know he takes the family with him and I, I don't blame him for that. I, do the same thing. Uh, I, you know, I have to ask you though, if he, um, I'll bet you there's one story about the ranching he didn't tell you. And uh, that was a little bit of Tom Sawyer came out in him. And I'd made a deal with him, a flat rate of painting. This was when at the ranch that I had previous to this one where the fences that I'd put in miles of them were the Kentucky type, the white post and three rail, two by six fence, you know. And I made a contract with him in the summer, a deal about uh, painting the vents. And then one day unexpectedly arrived at the ranch and he wasn't there. He was at the beach, but he had subcontracted out. <laughs> Not a bad arrangement, right? <laughs> and he had, he had someone doing it for him at not quite the total salary <laughs> that he was supposed to be a commission. Getting. And I had to say that um, I had to reprimand him as a, as a father and a son, but at the same time I had to think he's probably going to do all right. <laughs> Certainly doing well now on his, on his uh, boating ventures. You know, when he, uh, your office, the White House and uh, the presidency, uh, he told us what intimidates him most. He can call you here in, in, the, in the building and it's yeah. fine but he can't call you on Air Force One. Suddenly when he reaches you or they say he's on Air Force One, he says, oh my God, that's the president. I can't forget the call. Uh, uh, does he reach you much I there? I didn't know that. He yeah, never told me that. Uh, well, I'm kind of happy because I have to tell you, uh, he feels that way. I, I never seem to have as much luck on Air Force One with the phone. There. <laughs> I'm always having difficulty hearing the people at the other end. So uh, maybe it's just as well. His boating uh, venture is, of course, for business. Uh, he yes. sells the ads on the boat, and that helps uh, keep his company going. And he mentioned to us that every time he sells one of those ads, someone says, that's the son of the president, with sort of a question of maybe there's some uh, help we can get from Washington. Is it a problem for you that he's in no, business? No, I can't, I can't stop any of my children. I don't think any president should from going their own way in their own careers. He didn't, he didn't do this because I'm president. He was doing that. and. Uh, you know, he would have as much right to object to my being president. Um, he didn't, but um, no, and the thing that I also like very much about what he's doing is that uh, I guess there's never been an operation like this that has been so successful in, because all of the ventures are raising money for a worthy cause. Now the one that you were on was, as I understand, a cystic right. uh, fibrosis. and. Uh, He's done it for the fund for the uh, refurbishing of the Statue of Liberty. He's done it for the Olympic uh, Committee, and, right. and he's done it for a number of these worthwhile charities. So uh, I have to appreciate that. As a matter of fact, I think they broke kind of all records for an event uh, on this one that you were on and raising almost a quarter of a million dollars for the fund. Another story he told was about when he first realized you were really serious about politics. He said it was... Uh, back in California when they were getting a group together and you didn't like to fly. And uh, they, they said, well, you know, you've got to make this trip. And you said, on an airplane? Uh, well, okay, I'll do it. Do you recall that, uh, <laughs> well, that, that circumstance, uh, that story at all? For I don't, I remember there was a time when I knew that I was going to have to fly. This was after I had agreed that I would then seek the governorship. And it was true, I came out of, uh, military service in World War II, uh, and maybe, maybe a lot of fellows had some kind of feeling one way or the other. I, I'd never had a bad experience flying. As a sports announcer, I'd 
done many of those charter things in mm -hmm. a little two-place biplane with the helmet and the goggles on. But I just came out and I had a, maybe it was suddenly regaining my freedom that I, I had a, a hunch that I might get in the wrong airplane. Right. And I just grounded myself. And it turned out to be wonderful then when for eight years I was doing that TV show for a sponsor, which you'd rather I didn't mention <laughs> now. But um, uh, because then I had it written in the contract that uh, they couldn't ask me to fly. And in those early days of television, I found out how many of my friends who were in television were being run out of town uh, on an errand or a, an appearance or something uh, for friends of the sponsor uh, every other day. And uh, they couldn't do that to me because <laughs> traveling <laughs> by train would take too long. So it, it uh, paid off. But I knew when I agreed to run for governor that uh, I had to give up my hunch what he should have told you maybe is the story of the first day that I knew I had to fly and I called people who were handling some affairs for me and told them to get me a ticket on this plane. And then I waited for them to get up off the floor. They had never heard me say that before. <laughs> and you won't believe this, but the same day, on the way home there in Hollywood, I stopped at on the Sunset Boulevard, a newspaper, and got the afternoon paper, put it down on the seat beside me, and when the light was red at a traffic light, I was kind of looking at it. And the first thing my eye fell on was the very plane that in a few days I would be taking had taken off, lost a wheel on takeoff, had to circle while it dumped its fuel, and then land on the foam-covered runway. And I sort of, just as you did, I sort of looked up and said, make up your mind. <laughs> it might have grounded your career right then and there had you, had you been. Final question for us, if you will. Uh, a father's reaction. Just give me your uh, reaction from a father to what Mike has done, what we've captured on, on tape him doing. He gets a new boat. He takes it uh, on a, a trip where he said, I'm going to break 14 hours to set this uh, speed uh, record. He does it despite uh, some tremendous mechanical problems and some, uh, at one point I've given up. I said, we're never going to make Seattle. And he said, yes, we are too. Uh, he never, never uh -huh. wavered. And most important of all, he raised more money for cystic fibrosis, the number one genetic killer of children. He raised over $200,000 yeah. on this one day event that was all his energy, all of his effort that went yeah. into it. Give me briefly father's reaction. Well, of course, it has to be one of pride. Uh, I'm not that familiar with boat racing and all of the problems. I say I was surprised when I learned that for all those hours you stand, <laughs> you don't sit comfortably as we're sitting. Uh, but yes, I'm proud and proud of the fact that uh, he's doing it not just for a hobby to be racing a fast boat, but for uh, fun, funds of this kind, as we said before. And I, uh, I'm very proud and I understand from others who do know the ins and outs of racing, that um, he's very good at his job. Mr. President, thank you for talking with us. Well, it's a pleasure. Okay. Stop tape, please. Thank you, sir. Can you uh, say hello to our executive producer? Sure. Yes. That is for Mr. Weston. He is the, uh, the scheduler of events. When would it be convenient? <laughs> right. 
you know, I have no way of knowing that. Uh, real fast the word, you know, 10 o'clock on Thursday yeah. when I know you're on Thursday. Thursday, you open mid perhaps. So from next week on, keep watching. All right. You don't have to have a Nielsen set in your home, do you? <laughs> you don't have to have a Nielsen set in your home for television radio. No. I didn't think so. But I, uh, no, because when you asked me what would be right for me, you know, there's somebody in this building, I haven't found him yet, there's somebody that puts a paper on my desk every day that tells me what I'm going to be doing every 15 minutes yeah. for the next day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll let you pick them up. Yeah. yeah. We'll tell Larry. Okay. Thanks again. Well, thank you. 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 Th